uh, especially uh, welcome our visitors. Uh, glad that you're here with us and look forward to getting to know you a little bit better after services. Uh, <clears throat> we, we did have a men's business meeting yesterday and there was a few things we talked about. Uh, first thing that I uh, have is our gospel meeting is coming up and uh, it'll be that uh, that be the second Sunday of October and that's when we'll have our uh, we'll have our potluck instead of the, the first Sunday we, we'd like to uh, uh, begin our gospel meeting with a with a with the potluck so we'll uh, <clears throat> reschedule that for a week later uh, <clears throat> Fall Festival, we uh, set a date for that. That will be October the 29th. Uh, and there will be more on that. I think uh, uh, Brian will be meeting with us, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll plan that. Uh, another, another thing that uh, we talked about is teacher appreciation. Uh, we look forward to having that again this year, and it'll be the first Sunday in December. I think it'll be a part of our, our potluck in December. So uh, we'll be making plans for that and look, looking forward to it. Uh, I encourage everyone to look in a bulletin. Be sure and get a bulletin and, and look at the announcements in there. Remember uh, Jody, who is... Uh, in Belize, I understand things are going pretty well uh, there, and so uh, we'll continue to pray for pray for him. Uh, remember, Mr. Billy, he lost his twin brother uh, this week. Uh, Lynn and I had a chance to go visit with uh, with him, and and he seems to be doing pretty good. Very very disappointed, you know, about his uh, brother, understandably. Uh, I think the brother lives in Louisiana, and so Billy's not going to get to make that trip out there, and he was disappointed about that. But keep him in our prayers. If you have a chance to go by and see him, uh, that would be a good thing. Seemed like the best time to do that would maybe be around the uh, five to six time schedule. Uh, that's when the, his uh, son Mark and Cheryl are coming in from work, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, seemed, like, seemed like to be a good time. Remember, uh, Gary, I know uh, Lynn got a, a text from Connie this morning, and Gary might not be uh, feeling well, so we'll keep him in our prayers. Bill Bennett also, and uh, Sandra, we continue to keep our prayers. And good to see you here this morning. Uh, that, that's the announcements I have. Uh, may we pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come worship you. Father, we're thankful for the blessings you bestow upon us. We thank you for the good health that allows us to be here this morning. We thank you for the pretty sunshine. We thank you for... Uh, you know, the good night's rest we had last night, we appreciate or thank you for all the many blessings that uh, you bestow upon us. Lord, uh, we pray for this service. We pray for the, uh, Brian as he brings us a lesson from your word this morning. We pray that everything we say and do will be in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to number 368. Number 368. Yeah. 
646. Number 646. I don't think I've ever led this song, um, so if you know it, help me out. Please mark now number 653. Number 653 we'll sing as a song of encouragement after our lesson. Now we'll sing number 998, number 998, and we'll take the Lord's Supper. Voice 
In order to direct our thoughts this morning, I thought appropriate to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses, excuse me, chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that was made. And we thank you so much for the, for the beatings and the bruises of Christ and, and the breaking of his body that, was, that he suffered on our behalf. Father, I ask that we are mindful of these things as we partake of this bread. Praise your son's holy name. Amen. Please pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that shed the blood of Christ. And we thank you so much for what that meant to us and that 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 was the covenant that gave us the opportunity for salvation. Help us, Father, as we go through our lives that we remember that and it is this blood that cleanses our sins on a regular basis and help us to never be ashamed to approach that and to, to accept that grace that you've given us and and Father, we ask that, that, that you guide our minds right now and that we are mindful of the, of the blood that was shed for us and for what it means to us. In Christ, your Son's holy name, amen. Now that we've concluded the Lord's Supper, I'd like to take an opportunity to say thanks to God for the blessings that he had given us. Um, and, and I also want to say thank you to all who uh, contribute and set aside for the Lord because that, that's something that we do as a church, as a congregation. And, um, and after the meeting we had yesterday, I want to say that, that it fills me with a lot of thankfulness that we are able to help others through our giving. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed us in so many ways that, that we don't even know how to count or, or how to name the ways that you blessed us. And, and Father, I ask that, that, that we say or that we are thankful for the, uh, the monies that we were able to set aside for your sake and for your work and worship here at this congregation, Father. We, I ask that you bless the hands of those who uh, are, are, are responsible for managing this money, and, and I ask that you bless it uh, to your glory, that's used in your glory, and it's used to further your kingdom here in Sanford. For this your son's holy name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, or having all been made to drink into the one Spirit.
Good morning. Good to see you. Glad you have been able to join us this morning. So thankful for all those who serve here and work together. Uh, so thankful to, uh, to um, Mark for reading that passage for us. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Uh, so thankful to Steve for sharing with us um, those words surrounding the Lord's Supper. Uh, you know, I, as we were doing that, I was thinking about, you know, as, as we gather each week and we assemble as God's family, those who've been immersed into Christ, you know, we join a special collection, don't we? A special family when you become a child of God. It's the family of God. Uh, you know, this morning as we were taking Lord's Supper, each of us collectively are coming together. We are considering what our Lord did for us. And we do that as a joint activity. We all partake of the bread together. Uh, also, uh, you know, am moved by the idea that, you know, we, we, we then give together. Right? We, we uh, appreciate so much what Steve said about like, this is a joint activity. Um, in the passage that was read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want you to notice again what Paul lays out to the Corinthian brethren. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members. You know, there's a lot of different people here from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different experiences, people that make uh, this amount of money and some that make this amount, some that live here and others that live there, some of us that, 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 that have lived in very different places from one another, yet we come together as a collective whole because we are part of one body. It's an amazing thought to me. And this morning as we are assembling here, just think about all those across the globe that have assembled themselves together. And just as we jointly come together here, they are coming together. So you have all of these different uh, individual members of the Lord's body, yet they, we all come together with one single-minded purpose. He says, though many are one body... So it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Later on in that same chapter, he goes on in verse 14 to say, for, uh, for the body does not consist of one member, there's not just one individual member, but of many. You know, and not just uh, one talent person, right? We're all gifted in so many different ways. We all have different personalities. We have different uh, uh, drives at times in our lives. There are different things that give us enjoyment and pleasure. There are different things we seek out in our personal life. Yet, that one single-minded purpose, that, that one unifying purpose, that one thing that drives us the most of serving Jesus... And so he goes on later in verse 27 to say, Now you, Corinthian brethren, now you members at Sanford, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You think about the church, you know, it's, it's a pretty big endeavor that God invested himself in. When Jesus left heaven... Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and following. When Jesus left heaven to, to take on the flesh and form of a man, to live the life he lived as a poor carpenter, as a poor evangelist traveling around the area of Judea, a man at one time states about himself, he didn't even have a pillow to lay his head down on. He didn't have homes. Even foxes and rabbits have homes, don't they? But Jesus didn't have a home. To go through all that and then to, to sacrifice himself the way he did, all for one single-minded purpose. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he says to Peter, I came to do what? To build my church. To build my ecclesia. 
We, if you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, you are a member of that one body. It's an amazing thing that he's done. This morning, as we're thinking about this and, and thinking about this idea that, that now we are individually and collectively members of that one body, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. As fellow members of that one body, how does God call us to work together? Like I said, there's a lot of different uh, people here. A lot of different uh, experiences that we've had. Some of us have very, very different uh, uh, mindsets about certain things. How do we work together? How do we come together? I want to share with you a couple of things that I think are important in this regard. I want you to go first to Exodus chapter 18. I want you to notice a situation going on in Exodus 18. Now, if you've studied Exodus, you, uh, you, you may understand at this point, Moses, by the power of God, has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they're going to begin from here at Mount Sinai, this long journey through the wilderness, which you know eventually will take 40 years, to get to the promised land where Joshua will eventually lead the children of Israel into the promised land as God's prized um, uh, inheritance for the children of Israel. Well, as they're preparing for that journey, and there's a lot here we could explore, but there's one specific activity that I want you to notice going on. Now, Moses was the guy that God chose to lead his people. You remember in the burning bush, I believe it's Exodus chapter 2 and 3, where God confronts Moses from the burning bush. And he says, I want you to be, uh, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. Well, Jethro, oh, sorry, um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was a priest in, uh, I believe, Midian. And so it's out of that area that Moses then goes to Egypt and brings the people out. Now, Jethro is an interesting guy. He doesn't have a whole lot written about him, but here in Exodus 18, he gives some very wise advice, and I want you to notice what's going on. Verse 13 of chapter 18, the text tells us, the next day Moses sat to judge the people. And so he's coming, people are coming to, to have their disputes or concerns heard before Moses. He's the leader. It makes sense. Let's go to Moses. He'll decide this for us. He's God's chosen leader, right? And so he, he, uh, he has the people come, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. Now, I don't know if you have done much in the way of counseling people, but counseling and working with people through their issues can be taxing on you, right? You, you take on the emotional pain or you take on the weight of, of heavy decisions of other people's lives and that's going to have an obvious effect on you. I always think about uh, the presidents. I think it's something neat that you can go back and you can look that, that, that presidents over the history and you see the picture of when they were first elected and how young and vibrant they look. And then you see them at the end of their presidency, and it looks like the walking dead. Like, go look at some pictures of Abraham, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, right? Or, or, of, or some of these other men at the end of their presidencies. And, and they look different. Well, why? That job ages you. You're taking on a heavy burden, a weight of a country on your shoulders. That's going to weigh on you. And so you have Moses... Who, does he have some other jobs he has to do? Do you think his life's kind of full? I think God's given him a lot to do, and, and now here's another thing. And so he does that. Now, Jethro is standing by, and he's watching this. And I want you to notice what he says. 
Verse 14, what is this that you're doing for the people? You can almost hear that kind of, that, that, that tone in his voice, can't you? What, are you? what are you doing? Why do you sit alone? You can underline that word alone there, at least mentally, in your mind. Why are you sitting alone? And all the people stand around from morning till evening. Moses says, because the people come to me to inquire of God. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to turn them away? You know, I, Moses wants to help. He wants to be, hey, I'm the leader, aren't I? I mean, God put this responsibility on me. Notice verse 17. What's Jethro's response? What, what you're doing is not good. What you're doing is not, not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For this thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to, uh, uh, to do it alone. You can't, you can't bear this load by yourself. You, you're going to, to destroy yourself. You're going to wear yourself. What do we call it in modern times? Burnout. You ever gotten burnout in something, in a job? I bet some of us have experienced that in our lives, and we go looking for another job. Because <laughs> we're burnt out. I can't handle it anymore. If I have to look at their faces one more day, I'm going to go crazy. I bet teachers have to deal with this. Right? You see those kids every day? It's got to be hard. Moses is going through this and he's spending all this time and he's like, this is not good. Verse 19, he says, now obey my voice. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Verse 20, you shall warn them. I'm sorry, uh, let me back up here. Uh, verse 19, now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and Bring their cases to God. So you're going, my advice to you is you be the emissary between the people and God. Notice he goes on, verse 20. You shall warn them, the people, about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. And that's, that's your job. That's what I want you to do. Or what you should do, what I think you should do. Verse 21. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God and are trustworthy and hate a bribe. Place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens. Verse 23. If you do this, God will direct you and you will what? Be able to endure. What was Moses trying to do? We use another term for that, right? Micromanagement. Right? He's trying to do everything himself. He's trying to take it all on himself. Church activity, the work of the church, has never meant to be on the shoulders of any single individual. Too many times in churches, we have one person or one small group of people pulling the vast amount of the load. And what happens? Either the work is stifled and or the people become burned out, worn down, and move on to somewhere else. No one member should do all the work. No one small group of members should do all the work. Moses needed to hear that. Now, as the text goes on in verse um, uh Verse 24, the text says that Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law, Jethro, and did all that he said, and it brought relief to Moses. 
The reality is, is that we need each other. We need each other to bear a part of the load. Go to Matthew chapter 9, and I want you to notice what what Jesus has to say about the the grand work of the church. And talking about evangelism, what does he say about evangelism? He turns to his disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there there are many individuals looking for the truth, searching for the gospel, wanting to know what must I do to be saved. There is no limit or no scarcity on on the amount of of teaching and evangelism that needs to be done. That's not the problem. Do you want to know what the problem is? Go on and read. The harvest is plentiful, but what? The laborers are few. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Here's the reality. We have far too many who rely on someone else to do the work for them. Don't we pay a man to be our evangelist? We even give him that label sometimes. He's the evangelist. He's the one to to be out there preaching and teaching the gospel. Is that the way God established it? I think it's interesting if you go just into the next chapter, right, so we we see that in in verse 36, or um, just prior to verse 36 there and on, Jesus is healing people and he's casting out demons, he's doing all these things. Verse 36, he he sees the crowds and that's what makes him respond by saying, hey, the harvest is plentiful. I just need more people. Notice chapter 10 and verse 1. What does he do? He called to himself or called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. What does he He says, I can't do this alone. Look at all these people. I can't, I, I can't be responsible for doing all the work. I need you. That's why I got you 12. You're to take what I'm teaching you and you're to go teach others. You're to go and help others. You're to continue the work on. Did Jesus ever expect to do everything himself? Absolutely not. Why do we expect that sometimes in the church? Somebody else will take care of it. It'll get done. I know it will. I just don't have time to do it. Well, are we expecting too much out of others and not enough out of ourselves? Moses needed to learn that lesson. Not over for Moses. He still has some trouble, doesn't he? So God establishes in Exodus 18 through Jethro, he establishes this principle of judges. Well, if you go on into the book of Numbers, I want you to know, notice another uh, thing going on here. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1, the text tells us, and the people complained. Oh, they, the Israelites complaining? They never did that, right? We never complain either. Here they are complaining again. They're murmuring. Uh, They're complaining about what? We'll come back to that in just a minute. They're complaining in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. They began to complain and God said, stop complaining. And he did it in a very powerful way, didn't he? Think he got their attention? Well, for a time he did. They cry out, verse 2, to Moses. They ask him, you know, go to God, (laughs) tell him to stop doing this. And so God relents. Well, 
verse 4, what are they doing again? Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. Verse uh, number 10 says that Moses heard the people weeping throughout the, uh, their clans and everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly again. They're complaining again. They're rumbling again. They just did that. They're just not listening, are they? They're grumbling. They're complaining. Now, we can talk about that. That's a lesson for a different time about what all that was. What I want to focus on is think about what this is doing to Moses. He's having to deal with this again and again and again. Maybe we underappreciate the difficulty of Moses' job. He had a pretty tough job. And here they are again. Moses, verse 11, said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden, the burden of this people on me? And then he says something kind of funny, verse 12. Did you catch that? Did you read that ahead? Or did you go ahead and read ahead and catch it? Did I conceive all this people? All my kids? All right. All right. Did I give birth, or did I give them birth that, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as nurse, as a nurse, and uh, carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to their father, you swore to their fathers? Verse 14, I am not able to carry all this people alone. Here, here Moses is trying to do it alone, isn't he? He's trying to do it alone. Again. So he cries out to God. Verse 16, the Lord answers Moses. He said, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and the officers over them. Verse 17, And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and I will and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of of the people with you, so that you may not bear it alone. We are fellow workers, aren't we? We are to be a team. We are to work side by side, each bearing a part of the load, each endeavoring to do what God's called us to do. In the book of Ephesians, Paul, uh, Paul writes to these brethren about their, their, their commitment to one another. He says in chapter 1, uh, I know I have chapter 4 up there, but if you go back to chapter 1 in verse uh, 22, he says that, that Christ has been made the head over all things to the church, which is his body, us, the Ephesians, all the other believers are part of His one body. Chapter 2, in verse 19, He calls us members of His, or of God's household. Verse 21, He calls us a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And then you get to chapter 4 in this discussion of the one body of Christ. He says in verse 4, there is one body. This is the way as a side note. That's not the, the way the religious world today views the church, is it? They look out and they say, well, there are all these different types of bodies. We call them denominations. What did God say? He said there's one body. There's not denominations. My, my people are not divided up into groups. You're to be one, united together under the banner of Christ. You're to be one body. You go on down to verse number uh, 11, and he says, among that one body, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Verse 12, to do what? Why did he give all those different talents all those different jobs to do. 
Why, why did he provide all these different things? To do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of the church of Christ. We are fellow workers. We don't have one person or a group of people bearing the load, but we bear it together as a family, as working together to equip or to build up the church of God. In Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, the text tells us, Luke writes about the, the, this murmur or complaint that arises based upon uh, the Hellenistic widows, or Grecian widows, some translations will have. These widows are being missed in the daily distribution of the food as it's being passed out. And so the, the Grecian Christians are saying, you're missing our people. You need to care for our people. Verse 2 of that chapter says what? The apostles respond to this by saying, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, are they in some way arrogantly saying this is beneath us? That your complaint is not a good complaint? That, that, that we shouldn't care for your needs? Is that what he's saying? No, he's going back to this principle of we are fellow workers. This is the task God's given us to do. But he doesn't say, we don't care about you. But what, what, what's the response? You, brothers, choose from among yourselves seven men. Seven men to be over this work. To make sure that the widows are not getting missed in these daily distributions. I don't want them to be missed. And so now we need some people who, who, have, who, who need a job... And I want you to get them to do the job of leading it. Now, I also want you to know something else. Do you think those seven men were the ones out there handing out and, and going to each widow and saying, did you get your food? I don't think that's what's going on. They were then to, in, to bring others in, into the work, and, and they were to help. They were given charge over the work itself. You see how they were all working jointly together? They were to care for one another. And so they were brought into, into the work. And then verse 4, notice, we, uh, you do that and we will what? The apostles will devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We're going to do what we need to do because we trust you to do what you're going to do. And that's exactly what happened. Seven men were chosen. Those seven men took the lead on that. They made sure those Grecian... Do you know what you don't read ever again in the book of Acts? You never read of another complaint about Grecian widows being missed in the daily distribution of the food. And this problem never comes up again. Why? Because these men were given a task and they did what God called them to do. And I want you to notice especially verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Do you see what happens when we work together, when we are a team, when each of us tries to bear a weight of the load, of the work? What happens? We do much greater things. We can accomplish so much more when we work together. When a husband and wife work together and caring for one another and for their children. The family gets better. It becomes stronger. The children are, are cared for in a greater way. What happens when you have one parent pulling all the weight? Does it work as well? Or does it seem like something's missing? When we work together, we can accomplish so much more. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you remember what's going on there? They divided up. 
they've uh, dem demotionalized themselves. <laughs> they formed all these divisions in the church in Corinth. And Paul condemns them really strongly for it. And you notice the language he uses in verse 5. I'm sorry, um, yeah, verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? Now, you, what you had going on is you had some who were disciples of Apollos calling themselves Apollites. You had, uh, or Apollosites, whatever, <laughs> I don't know what term they might have used. Yet others calling themselves Paulites after the Apostle Paul. Yet others calling themselves, I guess, Cephasites after Cephas. And you had all these groups going on, and some were calling themselves Christians. You had this division, and Paul condemns it. And you notice in verse 5, he says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? But servants through whom you believed, as the Lord has assigned to each. Notice that, the Lord has assigned to each. God gave Apollos a job. God gave Paul a job. God gave Peter a job. God, God gave Joe and the congregation a job and Susie a job. And God expected what? Each to fulfill what his duty was. Notice as he goes on, I planted, that was the job God gave me. I planted the seed of the gospel. Apollos watered that seed, but God gave the increase or the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. No one job is more important than the other. The one who plants is not more important than the one who waters. Or vice versa. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. I saw this meme. Uh, Lisa was sharing it with me this week. And I, I think it, it really kind of brings this ideal out. The church is not a cruise ship where a handful of people serve everyone else who is relaxing. Now, I'm not saying that goes on, but could it? Maybe has it? That's not, that's not the church. No, the church is a battleship where it's all hands on deck and everyone serves the mission. I think it's a powerful statement. There's a lot of truth in that, don't you? Paul says to Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. What's the task God's given you? Do you find yourself involved in serving the Lord and His church? Or do you find yourself relaxing and waiting to be served? It can be very easy for any of us to fall into the trap of waiting to be served. Such a temptation. We're not, we're not kings in that way where we wait for others to serve us, but we are each a servant. We sing the song, Make Me a Servant. Do we mean it when we sing it? Make me a servant. The church can be a powerful tool of God when we each devote ourselves to the labor, to the work. This morning... As you consider where you are, are you a laborer in the kingdom of God? Or do you find yourself sitting on the sidelines and expecting others to meet your needs? How much have you invested in God's church? Are you a member of the church? We find in Acts chapter 2 the prescription of how we become a member of the kingdom of God. Did you realize that? You go back to Acts chapter 2 and you read verse 37. 
What do the people cry out? They say, men and brethren, what shall we do or what must we do? What's Peter's response? Repent. Change your heart and mind. Stop giving in to the sinful lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Give those things away. Serve God. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. 3,000 people, verse 41 tells us, did that very thing, were, were repentant of heart and mind and submitted themselves to being immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Verse 47 tells us those 3,000 were added to the kingdom of God. How do you become a member of God's kingdom? by being baptized into Jesus Christ. Have you been immersed into Him? This morning, if there's a need, any need at all, that we can help with, please come as together we stand and as we sing. How long has it been since you fought with the Lord and called in your heart in secret? How long Six twenty nine. Number six two nine.
turn to number 724. I put it up wrong on the board. Number 724. <coughs> this will be our closing song. for that lesson and appreciate everyone being here this morning, particularly those of you who are visiting with us. It's an encouragement to see you. We'd ask that you would remember those in prayer who have uh, been announced as sick uh, or traveling. I encourage you uh, to come back at five o'clock this afternoon if you have that opportunity uh, for a devotional at that time. If you would let us be dismissed in prayer. Great Heavenly Father, we're thankful for how you bless us each day, and we're thankful, Father, for the time that we've had to assemble here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for your word um, and for all the, the wisdom that is contained there. Father, we, there's so much uh, for us to be able to absorb, and we pray that you would help us to uh, lear, learn a little bit uh, each day, help us. Just as importantly, Father, to have the courage to make changes in our lives. Um, this life can be discouraging. It can be challenging. Uh, there's many obstacles that, that are placed in front of us each day. Father, help us to look to you and not to look to ourselves. Help us to trust in you and not in ourselves. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, take away our pride and, and help us to be humble, to walk with you. We thank you for how you take care of us when we do so. We thank you for the peace that we can have. We thank you for the guidance. We thank you for the blessings in this life that seem to come when we follow your will. And we're especially thankful for the hope that we have, uh, for the blessings that will come after this life as we uh, live with you for eternity. Pray, Father, that you be with this congregation here in Sanford. Help us to work together. Help us to support one another, to love one another, to encourage one another to good works, Father. Uh, help us to be unified uh, in your truth. We thank you for your son, for his love, uh, for the grace that we experience through him, the mercy that we have. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat>